All right, well, let's go ahead and, and make a start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, where we'll be discussing uh, two new reports from two major players in the international development space. First is the uh, World Economic Forum's report entitled Faith in Action, Religion and Spirituality in the Poly Crisis. The second is USAID's uh, Strategic Religious Engagement Policies. Policy. Both of these reports were published earlier this year, and now we have a chance to discuss them together here in the context of the G20 Interfaith Forum as we think about how to inform and shape the overall G20 agenda. Uh, my name is Judd Birdsall. I'm based at Georgetown University at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and also a professor in the theology department. Um, so you notice this session is very much hybrid. We have uh, three speakers joining us virtually, two here on the panel in person, and we have uh, in-person and virtual audience members as well. When we get to Q&A, we'll um, make sure that we can include both in-person and uh, virtual uh, participation. And I trust that we'll, we'll be able to have simultaneous uh, translation from English uh, and Portuguese as well. So bear with us as we deal with all the, the, the moving parts here. Um, here's what, how I'd like to spend our, our time together. First, we'll hear virtually from our WEF colleagues. They'll speak for about 20 minutes about their report and their broader uh, religious engagement uh, initiatives. Then we'll hear 20 minutes from USAID colleagues. Uh, then we'll hear a response from Kim Parent. Uh, and then around the one hour mark, I'll open it up to Q&A from our in-person and Zoom audience. And we'll close at the 90 minute mark, 4 p.m. Uh, Brasilia time. Now some very brief introductions of, of our panelists. You can read more about them online. But um, just uh, very briefly, uh, David Sangokoya is head of civil society impact at World Economic Forum. His colleague Jack uh, Hildebrand is a community specialist for civil society. Peter Mandeville to my left is senior advisor for faith engagement at USAID. His colleague Katie Thompson is a senior program analyst in the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at USAID, joining us virtually. And Kim Parent is a stakeholder engagement officer, stakeholder engagement officer at the World Bank. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Uh, and we had one more um, respondent today who's not able to join us uh, due to health uh, reasons. Well, thanks to our, our panelists joining us uh, in here and out there on Zoom. Uh, thanks to our, our audience members now filtering in uh, in person as well as joining us uh, virtually. Um, let's transition to our in-person. Um, colleague who's here with us, Peter Mandeville, and hopefully by the time he's finished, um, we'll be able to hear uh, from, from, from Katie as well. Thanks for, uh, for bearing with us. So Peter, glad you're here in person. We can hear you, I bet we can hear you just fine. We can see you, and over to you. Great, thanks very much, Judd, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, very grateful to the organizers, um, and very grateful to our colleagues from the World Economic Forum for allowing us to share this, this stage with them, um, where we'll each have the opportunity to provide you with an overview, um, a couple of recent, what we consider to be, for each of our respective organizations, important landmark documents um, that speak to the central and significance of faith-based partnerships in the work that we do. So as Judd mentioned, uh, my name is Peter Mandeville. Um, I am USAID Senior Advisor for Faith Engagement, um, and I have the honor to um, provide the lead to uh, USAID's Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Um, lest you think that faith engagement is something that USAID has come to very recently, in fact, um, we've been working with faith-based organizations since the 1960s when USAID opened its doors. Um, faith-based partnerships have been an integral part of the work that we do for decades. Um, since 2002, we have had a dedicated spot on, on our organizational chart and an office or center um, that has provided an institutional home um, for that work. Um, and more recently, as you'll hear in a moment, we've found ways to kind of try to take that work to yet new heights within the agency and in terms of our outward facing partnerships. Um, just to give you an example of what a USAID faith based partnership looks like, the, the, the sort of core idea here usually takes the form of 
a faith-based organization becoming an implementing partner um, of our agency. We're a faith-based partner that works in a particular part of the world or around a particular sector or issue, um, uh, you know, sees that USAID is looking to undertake a certain kind of activity or program um, and responds to a s -s solicitation alongside any number of other organizations and is then selected on the merits to be the implementer of that program. So uh, a typical example, and one that I'll mention because it's fresh in my mind because I had the opportunity to visit it recently, um, is a partnership that we have um, in Indonesia. As many of you will know, health and glo global and public health issues are one of the largest sectors that USAID works in. Um, in Indonesia, a country where unfortunately tuberculosis is endemic, um, carries the second largest tuberculosis burden in the world actually, both in terms of challenges relating to prevention and treatment. For the last 10 years, USAID has been working with Muhammadiyah, one of the two mass Indonesian Muslim movements, on a program called uh, Mentari TB um, that leverages a network of several hundred hospitals that Muhammadiyah manages literally across the vast archipelago that constitutes Indonesia as a country. By working with Muhammadiyah on these issues, USAID is able to scale its impact um, and just reach parts of the country's population that we wouldn't be able to reach with other kinds of partners. So that, that's just a typical example of the kind of faith-based partnership that we, we have. Um, our Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, which I mentioned was established in 2002, s has three core functions. So on the one hand, uh, we serve as a kind of point of entry for faith-based organizations that are possibly interested in working with USAID but are um, maybe wary of having to figure out how to navigate what can often be a very complicated donor bureaucracy, right? We, we are a U.S. government agency, which means that all of the requirements with respect to compliance, uh, various technical requirements apply to every single acquisition or award that we make. Um, and for kind of local and smaller faith-based organizations, that's sometimes a very intimidating bureaucracy. So we serve as an initial point of contact to help those faith-based partners identify other units and offices within USAID's vast bureaucracy that are relevant to their interests and their capacities and the work that they might want to do. So there's that partnership interface component. The second thing that we do is more inward facing and it's about um, building the capacity of USAID's own workforce to understand the value of faith-based partnerships and to integrate that work systematically across uh, their programming uh, portfolios. This involves the development of tools and resources um, that, that can help them assess the relevance of the faith sector in the various countries to the work that USAID is doing in that country um, and various other capacity building and collaboration tools that allow for exchange of experiences and best practices from one USAID mission to um, another around the world. So that, that, that capacity building component is the second piece of what we do. The, the third component of it, um, and in some ways the, the function that I'm fulfilling now, relates to policy and outward partnership building. Um, making sure that USAID's work on faith-based partnerships is part of a global con conversation among uh, other donor agencies, among other philanthropic groups, um, so that we have a sort of multilateral and global community of practice around faith-based partnerships, uh, looking for opportunities for, for collaboration and coordination. We do this internationally, um, but we also do it domestically as well within the United States in, in interagency. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of um, and something that I alluded to earlier was the fact that we recently took our decades-long engagement with faith partners to, I, I think, a new level by releasing last year, almost exactly a year ago, um, uh, a, a report or a, a policy document called Building Bridges, USAID's Strategic Religious Engagement Policy. 
Um, we're proud of this because it's actually the first time that any U.S. government federal agency has developed and publicly released an entire and comprehensive policy explaining why we work with faith-based partners, the value proposition associated with doing so, and provides a framework um, uh, for, for how we do this work, a, a roadmap of sorts. Um, it's my honor to have the role of leading the implementation of that policy. And I've been in my position for just coming up on four months now, um, and time permitting, would love to share a little bit about what that implementation looks like. But before doing so, and with fingers, and you can't see them, toes firmly crossed, that we can hear Katie Thompson, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Katie Thompson, uh, who will provide you an overview of the policy itself. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. And echo, echo thanks, thanks to the tech, tech team. I can't see you, but I trust that you are there. Um, so, 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 good so good to be with, with you all. all. Um, I'm sorry, sorry I'm not, not with you in person, person but um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, to join, join virtually. virtually. As, As Peter mentioned, mentioned um, my, my name is Katie Thompson. Thompson. I'm a senior, senior program, program analyst with, with the Faith-Based Neighborhood, Neighborhood Partnership Center at USAID. And, and I'm going, going to just spend, spend a few moments talking, talking a little bit about our new strategic, strategic religious engagement policy that Peter, Peter has previewed. Um, and, and as you heard in his kind of introduction of um, the, the center and USAID's history of, of work with religious communities, um, this, this policy does not represent kind of the first time um, or the first acknowledgement of um, the, the role, important and, and vital role of, of faith actors in development and humanitarian relief. But, but instead, it's a, a document that's really building on a long legacy within the agency, um, both within the center and across our bureaus, um, of, of engaging faith actors, whether that be religious communities, indigenous populations, um, and, and faith-based organizations of, of all different varieties. And, and so, so I, I want to just briefly, briefly outline um, a little, little bit of, of background, background on kind of, kind of how, how the policy came to be, and then, and then walk, walk you through some, some of the core dimensions, dimensions of the policy itself. And, and so, so just, just again, again, a bit of kind of, kind of context. Um, we, we've, we've had this long legacy of faith engagement, um, and, and, and it brought us to a season within the last couple of years of working towards um, really, really outlining, outlining for the first time a, a framework for the USAID workforce um, to kind, kind of speak, speak the same, same language, if you will, in terms of how we approach religious partnerships and faith-based um, um, engagements. And, and so, so um, we, we, we undertook, as, as a center and as a, as a broader team, team within, within the agency working on the policy, um, a season of listening to both the USAID workforce uh, in, in terms, terms of what, what were the needs, the challenges, the opportunities. Um, and, and we also took intentional kind of listening and leaning, leaning into a posture of learning with, with faith-based organizations and religious, religious actors, actors to hear more about, about what their experience has been historically with engaging the agency. And so, and so the policy really draws on um, many, many of, of the learnings and important, important contributions from that process. To get, to get us to a document that is designed to provide the workforce with, with more clarity on where and when and how we can, can engage faith actors, actors in a principled and consistent manner. And so, and so just to, to kind of emphasize um, kind, of kind of the purpose, purpose of the document, document, though it is publicly available, and we certainly, certainly hope everyone will read it, it's really, it's really a tool that, that is designed to guide the workforce itself and shape how we do business. And, and so, so just keep that in mind as I, as I, as I kind, of kind of walk through, through some of these points. points. And so, so thank, thank you um, to, to Peter, Peter or whoever just advanced the slide. I wanted, I wanted to just briefly kind of, kind of put on, 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 on the screen how we're defining strategic religious engagement. I think, I think you can see it there. Um, and, and it's really, you know, you know the, the definition is fairly, fairly straightforward, straightforward and, and that's intentionally so. Um, we recognize, recognize that um, this, this is an adaptive, adaptive approach. approach. It's, it's one that um, can and often should, should be applied in a variety of contexts and regions and countries where USAID is operating. And the policy, um, it has three core goals, and, and, and they really kind of mirror what Peter described as the, um, the work of the center, but I'll just briefly mention them. 
Um, one, one of the goals of policy is, is of course, to strengthen our partnerships and our work with religious actors um, with, with the end goal of strengthening development and humanitarian outcomes. And so, and so believing that, that if we have stronger, stronger partnerships, that will lead us to um, even more effective and sustainable outcomes. The second goal of the policy, as we've talked about, is really focused on equipping the workforce with the requisite knowledge and skill set to competently and confidently engage religious actors in our work. And the third goal of the policy is to more deeply integrate strategic religious engagement as a tool and kind of an approach um, within, within the agency and in all of um, um, our bureaus, bureaus and our regions where we're working. And so, and so our, our hope is that, again, this kind of um, framework, framework is embedded everywhere, everywhere you see a does business, business as opposed, opposed to just something that lives within the faith-based faith office itself. itself. If we could, we could jump, jump to the, to the next, next slide. So the, so the policy, policy um, it, it begins, begins by kind of outlining, of course, what, what we know already, kind of what, what the evidence has to say about the unique role um, and, and contributions of faith-based actors. actors. But then, but then it transitions, it transitions into a set, set of principles um, that, that, again, are designed to help the, the workforce kind of um, shape, shape our engagements. As you'll, As you'll see here, here um, maybe, maybe a surprise, surprise or no surprise, surprise they, they form the acronym RIDGES, um, and hence the name Building Bridges in Development. For the, For the sake, sake of time, I'm not going to walk through each of these. these. I think um, you know, you know, often they might be intuitive, and, and they, they do, of course, shape um, really, really all of the work that USAID, USAID does um, with, with our partners, partners be them uh, faith-based or not. Um, but, but this, this, these sets, sets of some principles, um, if you have a chance, chance to read the policy, um, really, really kind of are tailored towards, towards our engagements with faith-based actors. Next, Next slide, please. And then, and then the, the policy kind, kind of moves from, from these, these principles, principles to shape our work, work to, to you know, a, a roadmap, roadmap for action, for action um, um, really up with, with the goal of putting the policy into practice. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, just briefly, briefly touch on, on um, these, these four step, step framework. So, so the first, first is um, surveying, surveying the landscape. We uh, uh, want to take an intentional kind of posture um, and, and, and an approach to our religious engagement, engagement that recognizes that, that there's no, no one size fits all approach, approach um, that, that the context, context in which we engage are likely very diverse, diverse and, and different. And so, so it's important, important for the USAID workforce, workforce um, in, our in our mission and our country offices um, to, to be aware, aware of the dynamics and the religious just landscape in the context, context where they are, they are serving. serving. Next, set that the foundation. This, this acknowledges the importance of equipping our workforce again, again with those requisite, requisite knowledge um, and skills to, to partner, partner confidently with religious communities and faith-based organizations. Peter, Peter can talk, can talk in, in, a in a moment about some, some of the ways we're putting, putting this into practice even now. now. The, the third step, build together, together um, this, this recognizes that, that um, we, we want, want to ensure that religious, religious actors are um, built, built into, into the processes of how we are programming, programming our activities um, in, in the, the various contexts context in which we work, work um, and to, to ensure, ensure that religious actors really are part of the design and the implementation and execution of, of our, our programming. programming. And then, and then finally, finally, maintain and repair, um, recognizing that um, really, really the strongest partnerships are the ones that are built over time, time and, and often that, that requires um, a need for maintenance as well, as well as repair. Things, things um, may, may not go as, as, as had been originally, originally designed or hoped. And, and so this really, really encourages our staff to cultivate um, the, the posture and kind of relationship management um, of, of maintaining and repairing. And, and I have one more slide. Um, maybe just, just for a moment we can share it. Um, and this, this is a way to stay in touch, in touch with, with our office and, and to engage more deeply. deeply. I'll, I'll note just um, the email, email address at the, the bottom, bottom is probably the best, best way um, to, get to get any information, information that you might, might like um, to, have to have about the policy or otherwise. Or otherwise. And so, and so with, with that, that I'm, I'm going, going to um, pause, pause and I think pass, pass it back to Peter, who will, who will share, share just a closing, closing word or two. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. And yes, absolutely. Please do take a photo of this slide because this is the money slide that gets you to everything else. So 
all the other material we've presented um, is really derived from the policy itself. And so if you go to usaid.link backslash SRE, you'll get the entire um, policy document um, and all of these other addresses and links will allow you to reach out to us and connect with us as we very much hope you will. So as, as you know, after Katie provided the overview of the policy, I just in sort of 30 seconds or so wanted to quickly touch on some of the signature and flagship pieces of the implementation process for that policy, how we're taking it from being a document um, full of words to hopefully being valuable things in the world. Um, first piece of it focuses on pushing the capacity for faith-based engagement out to USAID's missions around the world. It's wonderful to have headquarters championing the policy, Administrator Samantha Power publicly launched it herself, took ownership of it, that was great. But we really feel that we won't take this work to the next level until our missions around the world routinely incorporate faith partnerships into their development toolkit. So this involves the development of resources such as the one that we're calling a religion and development landscape uh, analysis. And this is an analytic exercise where we um, take a profile of what the religious sector looks like in a given country and crosswalk it with USAID's own um, master strategy for that country, what we call our country development cooperation strategy document. It essentially lays out and defines USAID's development objectives for a given country, and these are often developed in cooperation with that country's own uh, government, as was the case in the I I Indonesia example I mentioned. And the purpose of this exercise then is to identify where there may be partnership potential and capacity within the faith sector that aligns well with USAID's priorities in that country. We're, we're also working on some other technical pieces like um, um, a, a course and interactive exercise called strategic religious engagement in the program cycle. The program cycle is the term we use to refer to USAID's base operational model. Um, and it's a sort of a long term, as the word suggests, cycle that includes everything from coming up with the basic strategy for a country, um, identifying um, sectors and programming activities associated with our goals, um, identifying partnerships, creating and implementing those activities, and then of, cru of course, crucially, uh, throughout the work, assessing it, modifying, learning, evaluating, and going back to the top of the cycle as well. And it's a tool to help them think about how that, that fits into that work. Um, we're also uh, looking at ways of creating new innovative partnerships with faith-based organizations that are not so much funding <coughs> FBOs to implement USAID's programs, but to recognize that there are faith-based entities that have their own resources. They're, they, they're not looking for a grant or an award from USAID. They have their own resources, and rather they want to come alongside us with those resources and with their priorities aligned with ours in a coordinated fashion to scale impact and output. And so we're looking at some of those and also just more broadly ways of multilateralizing the conversation about SRE to kind of make sure that there's increasingly a common approach within the global donor community to the ways in which we think about these. So again, thank you so much um, for being with us today and very much looking forward to hearing now from our colleagues from the World Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Katie. I'm glad the technology is working now. Thanks again to our, our tech support for all of that. Let me uh, hand things now immediately over to our colleagues at the World Economic Forum. If you have questions for Peter and Katie, uh, hold on to those, um, and we'll have time for, for Q&A once we've heard from WEF colleagues and from uh, Kimberly. So um, Jack and David, over to you. OK, okay. thanks, thanks again. again. Uh, uh, I hope everyone, everyone can, can hear me now. Hear me now. Um, so. So if any issues, issues, just let me know, me know. but uh, I wanted to start by just yeah, saying, saying thank you to the event organizers for inviting us to speak uh, and for getting, getting through, through the technical issues uh, and also for the opportunity to uh, speak alongside, alongside our esteemed colleagues from USAID. USAID. Um, sorry, sorry that we're not able, able to, to, to join in person, person but, but we're, we're very happy to have a chance to highlight uh, some, some of the recent work that the World Economic has been leading, leading uh, related, related to religious leaders and, and faith-based faith -based organizations, so, so namely, namely the Faith, faith in Action report, report, which was released earlier this year. This year. And, and um, I just, I just want to start by providing a little bit of background on the forum's work. 
um, as, as it might be news, news to some, some the, the, that while these, these activities, activities in the report you know, certainly, certainly mark a new chapter in the forms, forms of engagement with religious, religious communities, the organization itself has historically maintained a, a very close and intentional relationship with religious, religious leaders. leaders. Um, from, from the, the earliest meetings in Davos, Davos we, we've, we've always, always sought, sought uh, to, to include the insights of the religious and spiritual leaders and continue to see the growing, growing value of their participation and, and guidance uh, as long-term long and trusted leaders, leaders in their communities, but also you know, as key voices in addressing societal challenges. Uh, and, and David will speak more about the history of our engagement and provide a uh, look ahead, but um, for the Faith, Faith in Action report, report um, actually, leading, leading to the report in 2023, the, the forum, forum released a global, global risk report. And, and this, this highlighted the growing global trend of polarization, um, in relation to, to the environment, uh, uh, geopolitics, economics, as well as, well as the erosion of the social cohesion and, and just the, the growing, growing gap in our, in our shared values. values. Um, however, however you know, as, as the organization, organization for public-private public -private cooperation, we were, we were also seeing a growing, growing interest, interest among business, business partners to engage, to engage around common values and, and to you know, help uh, partner, partner with new types of organizations to assist with their ESGs and their corporate, corporate responsibilities. So, so faith, faith and spirituality, as we know, play, play a tremendous role in, in guiding, guiding our individual actions and creating, and creating a sense, sense of connection. Uh, in, the in the report, report we summarize this uh, as, as the power, power of religion, spirituality, and spirituality um, under three, three fundamental factors. factors. Uh, community, community, which is the shared identity of religion. religion. Creed, Creed, which, which are, are the principles and traditions that are formed over centuries. And, and citizenship, which is the ideological influence that it has on civic participation and consumer decisions. Um, so, so when channeling, channeling these, you know, faith, faith can, can make a huge collective impact uh, on current, current challenges and, and provide solutions that, that are aligned with our, our most sacred values. values. So, so these, these are the elements that led, led it to the creation of, of the faith, faith in action, action community, community and, and then the report. report. Um, and, you know, we, we, we saw, saw this as really our key moment to showcase, showcase the power of faith-based faith work. So, so this, this was the kind, kind of underlying message that, that we wanted to share, share with um, the, the form's broader, broader audience, uh, really, really reflecting, you know, the, 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 the current, current impacts, impacts being, being made by faith-based faith organizations, organizations, how, how global, global leaders are exploring partnerships, uh, faith, faith actors, and, and ways, ways to consider developing meaningful cooperation with faith, 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 faith actors, actors uh, and develop while, while at the time, time of, of growing polarization. So, so um, you know, we, yeah, we also wanted, wanted to address, address some, some of the major challenges in, in the report, report as well, well uh, uh, with the, the in terms, terms of engaging faith actors, faith actors um, specifically developing, developing skills, skills and structure within, within businesses, businesses and organizations, organizations to, to engage and, and facilitate conversations, conversations through shared, shared values, um, to, be to be able to align religious, ethical, ethical moral, moral goals with, with business, business objectives and, and create, create a clear, clear value proposition for faith engagement, engagement. Um, and, then and then to, to you know, have, have the faith, faith fluency, fluency or the, the understanding, understanding about, about goals of faith-based faith faith projects. So to, so to do this, do this the, the, the report, report laid out a concrete groundwork uh, for, for engagement value. value. We, we um, spent, spent a lot of time, time to highlight you know, how religion and spirituality can, can make impacts impact in today's, today's interconnected poly, poly crisis, um, showcasing, showcasing how, how faith, faith actors are working, working in partnerships with global, global leaders, leaders, especially for partnerships, partnerships with the private, private sector. Um, we, we included eight faith-based faith partnership case studies. studies. Um, some, some of these were on the environment, environment health, health, inclusive societies, societies and uh, technology, technology governance. governance. And, and, and finally, the report, report helps, helps to identify, identify what, are what are the key drivers in developing those meaningful cooperation uh, and, and partnerships and creating, creating greater faith, faith fluency uh, at a time when there is a, a decline in trust. So, so I, I know we don't have enough time to dive, dive into all of them, but um, I, I just want to quickly highlight two, two which I believe are most relevant, relevant to the Interfaith Forum's priorities. Uh, these relate to food and environment, and, and also conditions that uh, would lead, could, could lead to human trafficking, trafficking as well. As well. 
So, so on uh, the environment and sustainable, sustainable food systems, systems um, you, know, you know, there's, there's clear opportunity for religious, religious traditions to be a driving, driving force in developing, developing partnerships and creating, creating impact by drawing from the common, common thread of environmental care, care that is across all faiths. Faith. Um, while faith, faith actors possess considerable, considerable size and influence, so, though, um, they, they, they often lack the expertise to bring, bring you know, environmentally conscious products, products and services, services to market, or, or alternatively, uh, businesses, businesses might, might not have, have not, not be able, able to leverage those networks um, to, help to help their own, their own activities become, become more environmentally sustainable. sustainable. Uh, so, uh, so one of the case studies we included provides sort of solution, sort of solution for both of these challenges. Um, in, in 2020, there, there was an Indian, Indian company, company called Hari Haribol Dairy, Dairy Products, products which, which sells traditional, traditional Hindu groceries. groceries. Um, and, and it began and working with, with the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and um, partnered, partnered with, with them to be connected, connected with 700, 700 different, different temple communities in order, in order to provide products that are aligned with Hindu animal, animal welfare, welfare ethics, um, otherwise, otherwise that are, are challenging to acquire outside, outside of India. And Haribo's products themselves come, come from, from native cow breeds, breeds that are more resilient uh, for climate, climate and produce lower methane emissions. And they, and they also, also use tracing technology so that consumers know exactly, exactly where their milk is coming, coming from um, and, and the products are in line with Hindu values. So, so the, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness uh, supported, supported the business by introducing them to these communities and faith leaders and provided a, a platform for them at major religious gatherings while emphasizing the importance of Hindu standards and environmental care. Um, and, and with, with that, that, the company, company went on to work, work on community empowerment. empowerment. They, they offer trainings on uh, livestock management, management emission reduction, and have, since their, their introduction, have brought 2,000 rural, rural communities into the supply chain. chain. So, so um, just as a key lesson, you know, we see this as business, uh, businesses, businesses should acknowledge the opportunities that, that exist with marrying those faith networks, networks with, with environment-friendly goods, uh, uh, while faith, faith and value-led value solutions, uh, solutions uh, should also be explored as a way to provide positive social and economic impacts on these communities. Um, and and second, just briefly talk about another case study. Uh, this was the Transform Project, which was born between the partnerships with the um, Global Solidarity Fund and Unilever. Um, the, the program was an impact accelerator that was launched in 2021, and its aim was to deliver market-based solutions to marginalized communities in Colombia. So the program itself uh, aimed at fostering social entrepreneurship and broadening labor market access to migrants and refugees. Uh, and one of these social enterprises, for example, was the uh, Powered by the People, which was a wholesale market that helped to enable artisanal makers access to global markets through a business-to-business -business tech platform. And, and, you know, you know we wanted, wanted to highlight, highlight the success, success of this partnership was really creating those synergies between both stakeholders that allowed for um, you know, these unique economic opportunities to be unlocked in vulnerable communities. So ultimately, um, from, from, from these case studies, we, we hope that the report's findings would serve as a practical guide uh, and contribute to creation of more robust, scalable frameworks for effective collaboration between both business and faith. And, um, you know, just to kind of close uh, on some of the recommendations from the report as they would apply to um, the interfaith forums, um, parties, and, and the, within the G20's agenda, um, I, think I think we would want to stress that organizations need to increase their readiness to be able to engage with FBOs while also respecting differences. Um, and, and this can be done by creating more of a, a fostering, fostering environment that encourages engaging with more diverse stakeholders um, and also the ability to, to discuss and, and address those challenges. Um, second, having more alignment on goals. Um, businesses need to develop more faith fluency in order to really genuinely depict their understanding and the value of faith-based partnerships. Um, um, rather than pursuing, pursuing engagement as a, a token, um, um, as part for public relations. And, and this means really developing, a, developing a faith fluency that allows for a more strategic and contextual understanding of faith communities and traditions, 
uh, uh, that can allow meaningful, meaningful engagement. engagement. And, and, and finally, uh, building, building better, better public, public perception and trust. Um, so, so this, this can, can be uh, awareness campaigns, workshops, workshops educational, educational programs to help inform the public about, about faith, uh, um, and inform informed employees, employees about, about the value and positive impact, impact of faith-based initiatives, initiatives and, and also, also to encourage more, more interfaith, interfaith dialogues to help bridge any sort of understanding. So, so on, on that note, you know, this, this is something that the forum is very much interested in working, working in, and, and I will hand it over to my colleague, colleague David, who is going to talk a little bit more um, about, about some of the work that we're doing and our engagement with faith-based organizations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jack. Uh, now, David, yes, over to you. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Jack. Um, and thank, thank you, everyone, everyone, for giving, for giving us the opportunity to speak on this, this important work. work. Um, my, my name is David Singakoya, and I'm lucky enough to lead the team at the forum that um, leads on civil society engagement at the forum. So all the engagement of NGOs, unions, social movements, activists, and of course, um, religious leaders and faith-based organizations. Um, as Jack mentioned, we have a long-standing um, relationship with religion um, and spiritual leaders um, at, at the forum since the first Davos. Um, our founder and chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab, felt it was important that as we're bringing together leaders around the global agenda that we make sure that we are we are portraying well the world of faith and that faith is a key part of how we're seeing and understanding the world the traditions and the different trends that are happening around the world and that's since the first of us um, around 55 years ago so as part of that history we have roughly 125 more active religious leaders faith-based organizations and experts of religions that we work with from over 10 of the world's major religions and spiritual traditions, reaching about 3 billion people globally. It, we're, we're honored to be able to hold these relationships over time and learn from them through the work. As part of the civil society engagement at the forum, it's our team's mission to make sure that these stakeholders, among other stakeholders, are engaged across the forum's work, which are housed in 10 thematic centers, where we do um, you know, a series of initiatives, leadership communities, etc. Additionally, we ensure that we have the presence of religious leaders during our annual meeting in Davos in Switzerland, where they come in to talk about the state of the world and bring perspectives from their various traditions. We additionally, you know, over the last few years, I would say particularly in the last 20 years, started to explore where can we partner with a variety of different organizations to make sure that, you know, content around the role of faith um, particularly, particularly in public-private cooperation, is more visible in the world and using our platform to do so. We have um, brought together leaders around uh, what we call a transformation map, which is um, essentially put together strategic intelligence around what are the latest trends around a certain topic and push that out to business leaders across all of the forums, industry communities. So we work, um, I, I think on this work, we've worked with Religions for Peace and a few other leaders to bring that together. Um, we, after 9-11, brought together a group of leaders around, um, I think we called it the Council of 100, to look at Islam in the West and to try to nurture relations there. And then since then, we've tried to create a series of content um, levers around religion and world affairs. We worked with the Berkeley Center in Georgetown for quite a while with our, one of our global agenda councils and a few other um, entities around, again, the role of faith and systemic challenges. What, what we, we have been, been learning from the Faith and Action Report, a few things. things. One, just, just the need for us, even as an organization, to expand our engagement of who we consider faith actors, and, and really acknowledging the way in which leaders from all traditions and backgrounds and stakeholder groups, so including individual business leaders, faith-based investors, new coalitions, young people, how they are bringing their, bringing their values, bringing their faith, to, to the center of their work and to their leadership, and where, and where we can bring that into um, more conversations around faith and religion. The second, I would say, is you know fostering new connection between business and faith communities. If you can imagine in the bureaucracy that can sometimes exist in organizations like ours, the faith organizations engagement can sit on one side, the business engagement sits on the other side. Where can we create those synergies, especially when there are several business leaders who are looking for more of that engagement, looking for more examples of where they can engage with um, faith-based communities in a way that makes sense, in a way that will have impact.
Um, and, and then, then lastly, I think for us, us as a platform and as uh, the organization for public-private cooperation, we're trying, trying to create an uh, important space around dialogue and impact, impact where each stakeholder, stakeholder can see what the value proposition, proposition that they bring together, and, and we can foster the types of partnerships that we're seeing, um, both in a report, the type, the type of work that USAID is championing in its own right, um, and you know where we can you know, bring together these entities to learn from one another, because these partnerships didn't come from nothing. They, they came, came from, from a lot of hard work, work and a lot of the individuals, I think, who are in the room and definitely on this call, I can see with Katie um, and her colleague, you know, it, it came from those individuals who really championed it through the different channels. And so where can we talk about when partnerships get hard? How can we create a space to do that in a way that makes sense, that is safe, but then also we can, we can celebrate, celebrate where we're seeing more and more um, business and other leaders um, take those risks and see the value. Um, I'll, I'll end just because on a note on the report just to say, I think the one of the greatest things to see was that, you know, business leaders weren't afraid are weren't afraid of doing this engagement and are, were not leaving impact on the table. Where there was interest and where there is value, they sought the opportunity. They came through our, the trusted network of the forum to do so. And so we're, we're looking to see what else we can do with our platform to foster these types of partnerships. What will happen next is, you know, we're looking towards a series of different summits that will bring together faith leaders and business leaders together to, again, create that platform for conversation and to experimentation and to see where we can go next. Uh, David for sharing with us and uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues for the new report. Um, let's show our appreciation to our virtual WEF colleagues. <laughs> so again to our uh, audience be thinking of questions you might want to pose to our uh, panelists in just a moment but before we do that I want to hand things over to Kimberly Parent for a response based on her vantage point um, uh, from the World Bank. Kim over to you. How about this one? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much for your patience. Um, and I just want to say a quick moment of gratitude for USAID and for the World Economic Forum. Um, as the World Bank, I always love, well, as somebody who's here representing the World Bank, um, I always love to have reports and facts and data that I can really dig into and understand where these different impacts are. Um, for the World Economic Forum, uh, I really appreciated your recent report that came out, um, and I saw quite a few parallels for work that we're trying to engage in that were clearly articulated from a, a, a vantage point that was really uh, valuable. So I just want to step back for a moment and introduce myself. Um, I work at the World Bank in the stakeholder engagement team. I lead our engagement with faith-based uh, faith organizations, faith actors, um, and also um, I work closely with civil society organizations. So one of the things that the World Bank has recently kind of undergone is this evolution roadmap process. Um, and many of you will have seen that and contributed to it. We had over 600 civil society groups, faith-based organizations, think tanks, and academics who provided strategic direction um, through consultations on what they would like to see the World Bank do and change and how that process and our operations can be shifted. And from that uh, process, we had a very clear set of outcomes, and one of which was the need to deepen partnerships. So while our primary client is the government, we need to figure out how to make sure that we are pulling stakeholders in at every stage along the way. Um, we do quite a bit of work on this, but we're looking now systematically at what we can do to make sure that we are engaging as effectively as possible. And we actually recently launched our very first partnership charter that lays out the principles for how we like to engage and what we would like to do for engagement. So with that background, I'd like to speak a little bit about our faith strategy and what it is that we're trying to work on. And now um, our work, uh, again, the bank, much like our colleagues here, has been engaging with faith actors for a very long time. What we're looking at right now is in the current context, how we can do that as systematically as possible. 
We're already doing it in quite a few countries, but how do we make sure that we are doing it across the board and that we are doing it in a way where all of the different organizations, however small or large or global or regionally focused or thematically focused, know that we want to engage with them. So our faith strategy focuses on four main points. We have advocacy, relationship building, operations, and building an evidence base. And what I find so compelling about the work that's being done here with USAID and WEF is that they have really clearly shown a few points that need to be developed a bit more effectively um, in our own strategy and in our own work. Um, and I, I just want to note, uh, my apologies, these were not necessarily the points that were raised by my colleagues. So if I misrepresent your point, your report or your findings at any time, feel free to step in. Um, but I found that one of the things that was so vital was the focus on communities. Across the board, it was this emphasis on the fact that faith-based organizations are particularly effective at understanding the community needs, at communicating to the communities in language that is effective, and that really hits every person in that space so that everybody can be included and everybody can kind of hear a bit of messaging that comes throughout. There's a lot of emphasis in both of these strategies on localization on understanding the specific country contexts while still maintaining the need to focus on the larger global action, like poverty, climate change, hunger. It's really quite compelling to see how such different kind of work can come out with very similar conclusions about what the next steps should be. So from my perspective, that's particularly valuable as I look at the operations that are ongoing at the World Bank and try to understand how we can most effectively engage with faith-based organizations and faith actors at the country level. So we're looking right now at um, understanding what's already taking place because quite often we find that this engagement, it exists, but maybe it's not captured and reported in a way that's clear for those of us who are sitting in Washington, DC. And we're looking to understand how we can use that data, those case studies, those examples, to make it very clear to other teams, other projects, other operations, that this can be done, right? That this is something that can and should be done in order to improve the impact of our projects. You know, I've been very inspired by quite a few of the speakers today, but the idea that everything seems impossible until you've done it is one of those threads that's kind of been throughout the different event. And I feel that strongly in this kind of reporting and in this kind of conversation. Um, and so from our perspective, this emphasis on community, on partnership, on poverty is crucial. Um, and it aligns with a lot of what the World Bank is prioritizing right now. Like, for example, we have our, our IDA program, which focuses on the low-income countries and trying to make sure that there are grants and low-interest loans that can really help countries to invest in their own projects and their own communities. Trying to focus on things like hunger, um, on fragility, on poverty, um, and they are they are things that we hear echoed throughout this space, throughout the IF, uh, 20 throughout the G20 itself um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from more of you all about how we can really work together to make sure that in a local community country context we are being as supportive as possible um, and there's one other element that I, I just want to flag that I think is really crucial um, and I know I've heard USAID talk about it in the past um, which is that this needs to be a, a two-way communication Right? We are very interested in, in working to engage with, with uh, faith actors and making sure that you know, what we've learned and what we've heard and what we see as best practices is communicated to the different groups. But all, just as important, we want to make sure that we are hearing from the communities about what they need, what their expertise has shown them, and what resources they have and can share with us. You know, we see time and time again that especially in places of fragility or conflict and violence, faith-based organizations remain embedded in the community throughout the entire process, and they are the organizations that we can get the best feedback from and that we can often provide um, either additional resources to or work to kind of channel programmatic activities through. Um, and sometimes that's directly, and a lot of times it's indirectly. It's figuring out how we can work with the government or how we can work with another partner to engage in a complementary way. Um, so I just wanted to note that, that that's another feature that I think is, is really critical and I'm hearing um, 
in some of these reportings and discussions. That's it for me for now, um, but I, I'm grateful to be here and to have these conversations with you guys. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Um, now we have the opportunity to open it up to the, the floor. We have a wonderfully diverse audience here. I'm really looking forward to uh, questions and comments uh, you may have either for those who are here in the room or on, um, uh, on the screen with us. Um, in terms of getting questions to the people on the screen, we'll, well, we have a microphone. Yeah, um, if you raise your hand, I'll call on you. Um, Zhao will, will bring a microphone to you and so everyone in the room and as well as those joining virtually will be able to hear. And all told, we have about 25 minutes for this uh, Q&A and we'll end right at uh, four o'clock. Who'd like to open us up with a question? Yes, over here. Yes, uh, my name is Bina Nepram and the Senior Advisor on Indigenous Issues at the U.S. Um, Institute of Peace. It's wonderful to see my former colleague right now doing really good work. Uh, my question is really, really important, the uh, work that you mentioned in Indonesia and the uh, work growing worldwide. It's really inspiring. The last two days have been also interacting with so many faith leaders is making us understand how important this issue is. My issue is, uh, question is very simple. In terms of this uh, uh, religious strategic engagement, have you uh, engaged with r indigenous religious actors in your work or are you planning to? And in what way can this be another factor in terms of covering over 476 million in 90 countries can be an added advantage to the work that you already started? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, Peter or Kim, do you want to uh, take an initial uh, attempt at responding to that? And then we can open it up to our, or, or bring in our, our virtual speakers as well. I'm, I'm happy to, and Bina, thank you for the question. It's wonderful to see you again as well. So um, there are maybe two points to make in response to your question about where uh, a focus on indigenous communities and the unique perspectives and experiences and resources they bring to so many of these issues, how that relates to USAID's work. Um, uh, USAID's faith-based center um, is bureaucratically lodged within a, a structure called the Local Faith and Transformative uh, Partnerships Hub within USAID. And that's also um, a unit within the agency from which we do our work on inclusive uh, development, um, which is a um, recent push at USAID that tries to make sure that our work is inclusive, not only in the sense of reaching as many people and benefiting as many people as possible, but making sure that the way that we approach and design and implement the work reflects the experiences, priorities, and perspectives of as wide a range of communities as possible, very much in line with the point that, that Kim en ended on. And, and the, the, we, 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 we do have um, specific uh, staff capacities with respect to um, the, the integration of indigenous communities and perspectives in the work that we're doing. It's not nearly at the point that it should be, but it's something that we're quite open about and, and working on. The second piece of it does relate more directly to the faith-based center's work, particularly um, our efforts to encourage those of our colleagues at USAID who do work on the natural environment, um, climate change, to recognize um, that um, the religious perspectives and practices of indigenous communities um, are often vitally important um, in terms of their understanding of the natural environment and how it relates to the spiritual values and, and systems that define their lives and, and, and cultures, and that this necessarily needs to be integrated into the work that we're doing. So for example, um, so USAID um, does work in partnership with the government of Br Brazil um, around the Am Amazon rainforest ecosystems um, and partnerships with indigenous communities are a vital component of that work. Um, and we're starting conversations with them right now um, about where um, Amazonian indigenous spirituality um, finds a place within that work. Thank you.
Kim, is there something you want to add on that point? I just wanted to note that from the from the World Bank's perspective, that kind of sits into, again, two different spaces, right? We have a team that looks after indigenous rights and other activities and communities that take place through different projects. Um, and then from the faith engagement side, you know, we are happy to engage with whoever would like to engage with us. Um, so I am more than happy to connect on this and make sure that the perspective is being heard uh, at the bank. Um, and one of the key features of my role at the bank is to serve as a bridge. So it's to say, okay, you know, you have a specific question, you want to make sure you're heard by this group or on this topic or with this perspective, and I can help to find the correct person to make sure that you're tied into it. So if there's a country office or if there is something that is ongoing or you feel like your voice needs to be amplified, I'm more than happy to, to help to, to fill that space. And our WEF colleagues, did you want to come in on this question of the inclusion of ind indigenous voices? Yeah, yeah no, I'll be very brief. brief um, so, so we, um, um, it's part of our remit as civil society. society. It's, it's a very broad remit, but it also includes the engagement of indigenous leaders. leaders. Um, at, the at the forum, we engage them as, as experts, experts across all the work that we do. We, we, we recognize where the lack, the lack of understanding of where indigenous, indigenous knowledge fits into solutions is a big problem. And so as part of that, we've created this global indigenous knowledge and leadership network where we're bringing, you know, we're engaging with indigenous peoples across all the seven socio-cultural regions to better understand where their specific knowledge can contribute to nature-based solutions, can contribute to trade, can contribute to a variety of different topics. And, you know, that's a community that exists on its own that, you know, and all the members members are part of existing forum work. And so that community is, we've launched in Davos a couple years ago and is moving forward. Um, we, in terms of the indigenous faith work, we, um, two years ago, held a conversation around indigenous values and faith values and bringing that together in Davos in a very special and sensitive dinner. Um, and it was, it, was quite a, it was quite a moment to see sort of, of course, there are challenging histories there that we needed to discuss, but then at the same time, where can we safely include these unique perspectives um, from the indigenous religious leaders in the, in the broader discussions around, around faith as well. And so that's, that's something, something we've done. done and, you know, we, as I think maybe Kim has just said, you know, we are very happy to meet and new folks um, along that, along those lines to learn more and to see where we can incorporate them. Yeah, thank you so much. That's great to know about the Indigenous, Global Indigenous Knowledge, Knowledge Network. Um, how do we connect with, with you all on this? because you are virtual. <laughs> Kim is here, we can catch her, but how do we get hold of you? Yeah, yeah, no, our apologies. So I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to send out sort of information, information on where you can connect with us. We do have some links um, that hopefully maybe we can connect with the organizer on that, but we have links to all of this work that you can learn more um, and learn how to get engaged. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, second hand I saw was back there, the gentleman back there. And then uh, who else has a question just so I can jot down? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Aaron Ariel Avi. I'm the managing director of the Ottawa Interfaith uh, Center. I actually have two questions. One question about USA idea. Uh, you mentioned, you talked about a lot about how you work with each country separately, with each embassy, each mission. Uh, is USA idea also open or is there a structure to work uh, internationally, like a co collaboration between several countries or several, several religions in different countries. Uh, that's, that's one question. My question to the World Economic Forum uh, is more of, I mean, I'm very excited about what you, you've described and how faith-based organizations can be part of this. My question is, is there any pushback that you get from business leaders who might say, like, why do we need this? What's the purpose of this? It's just another burden. Like, we're not here for this. We're here to do business, not to hear about religious ideas. If there's no pushback, that's great. If there is, I would love to know just so we can be prepared to this kind of conversations. Thank you for those questions. Peter, do you want to um, tackle the first one? And then we'll hand it over to WEF uh, for the second very interesting one about pushback. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the question. So while the, the kind of standard operational model for our programs is um, through um, 
bilateral missions. That, 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 that is a USAID mission usually co-located co with the US Embassy in a specific country. There are a number of exceptions to that. So for example, um, we have based in Bangkok something called USAID's Regional Development Mission for a a Asia, which runs a number of programs which are designed to be transnational in scope, broadly covering the Southeast Asia region. In Africa, our missions in Senegal and Nairobi, while running programs that are specific to each of those countries are also regional hubs or sub-regional hubs um, through which we run programs that have a regional mandate. The international and global level, um, we do absolutely enter into um, various kinds of partnerships that involve a di diverse range of governmental and non-governmental actors, um, usually through some sort of memorandum of understanding or cooperation. So we, we do incorporate um, that, that broader range of modalities in, in into this work. And our WEF colleagues, anything on, on pushback? Yeah, yeah so, so happy to answer, answer that, that and great, great question. question. Uh, um, so, so, you know, know I think for, for us, we have um, kind, kind of the advantage uh, of these very close relationships with our business partners as well. And, and I think that the current stage that we're in or the, the current you know, era, it's, it's, it's much, much more open than it might have been in the past in terms of what types of organizations um, are deemed worthy or would be effective for, for partnerships. And I think that a lot of this is, you know, in credit due to the, the work of faith-based organizations and becoming much more vocal uh, on the global stage. So just, you know, for example, with the Faith Pavilion, uh, the COPS, I, I think that you know, you know the, the, the value, value expertise, expertise and trust, trust especially that uh, faith-based organizations have established uh, in addition to just historically being the service providers for housing nutrition um that have really kind of made the value quite quite clear and i think in, in terms of pushback it's it's less about you know why would we and more strategically how could we and, and, you know, you know that, that might be, be uh, for public perception, perception but, but I believe that, that also is changing as we're seeing a lot of businesses, um, larger, larger organizations start to include more faith uh, employee resource, resource groups. So I think the next intuitive step is really, you know, how can we go from these kind of internal spaces to actionable partnerships that reflect the exact same types of uh, levels of inclusion and, and um, you know, you know innovation in terms of partnerships. Thank you. Two quick points, points from me, yeah, if you allow me. Oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Two quick, Two quick points from me, if you allow me. So I think, um, as Jack mentioned, really more businesses are no longer asking why, but how broadly on civil society engagement. And that's due to a lot of the different societal sort of pushes. If you look at stakeholder capitalism on a lot of different things, and you're seeing business leaders actually talking about faith, going to the Vatican and joining a lot of different dialogues, et cetera. So it's, as Jack said, you're seeing a lot of that actually happening visibly. I think the question around how much do we invest in it? is, is like, like the question that I think maybe you're trying to you push at in terms of how much, you know, if I'm a business, then how much do I really push on this? Answer, that's the types of conversations that we're trying to host more and more because, you know, some businesses are afraid about their neutrality by engaging on some of this work. We definitely have seen that over the last few months um, of what's um, around the Middle East crisis. And so I, I do think there are those sensitivities that are real, that do exist. But again, on our side as the forum, by having this, these spaces for constructive dialogues, we're hoping to show that it's possible, um, that it can happen. And if you're looking for how, there are a lot of great examples to look forward to. Thank you, David. Katie, anything you'd want to add? Nothing, Nothing to add. Thank you, Judd. Okay, great. All right, well, we have, uh, looks like about, about 12 more minutes, and there were there were two questions here and two questions on this side. So in the interest of time, when we do these, the, both gentlemen here had questions. If you want to bring the, yes, yeah, we'll come to you. Um, why don't we take these two uh, and then have another round of answers and then the two on this side. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, my name is Sheikh Ibrahim Lethomi from Kenya. I am a Muslim religious leader. I have an organization called Center for Sustainable Conflict uh, Resolution, 
And what we do mostly is use religion to counter violent extremism. Because as you know, we are next to Somalia because we work closely with USID Kenya. But what I believe is that for effective partnerships, we need to understand one another. And I'm glad I had something to do with building the capacity of faith-based organization and faith leaders to understand how USAID, the World Economic Forum, acts. What I want to know is, on the other side, is there any deliberate effort or programs to build the capacity of USAID and the World Economic Forum to understand religion? Because I think it has to be mutual. Remember, when you talk about strategic religious engagements, you're talking about having common goals. And for us to be able to, wor to work towards that common goal, I think there should be understanding. I personally sometimes find myself at a loss. I do not understand how you operate. I need my capacity to be built to understand. At the same time, sometimes I feel uh, the development partners do not understand how faith organizations operate. And therefore, I feel there should be a, a deliberate program also to build your capacity to understand how religious organizations operate. That is my concern, and thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. And we'll go straight to this uh, gentleman here. Um, I, can s I can speak in English, but I prefer speaking in Portuguese. And you can help me to translate my question because I think it's, ah, OK, it's OK, né? OK. Uh, o Brasil, ele tem o fundo amazônico. Né? Então, é muito fácil nós falarmos da região amazônica. Mas o Brasil... Uh -huh, OK. I can try to translate. Yeah. OK, what do I, I'm not hearing you from the country. Here in Brazil, we have the Amazon, fa the Amazon, the fall of Amazon. Yeah. And it's so easy to talk about the Amazon. But Brazil is such a continental country. And then, then we have a lot of different uh, ways of weather, like our flowers, like here and other regions, that are such important for the Brazilian without hunger. Especially for the traditional communities. I am from an Africa one. And we have this problem, that is the financial of projects with the traditional point of view. When Kimberlin said about hunger, uh, poverty and climate change, I get in your point of view to see if you guys contemplate our point of view, the Brazilian point of view. E como o nosso and how us from Brazil can, can interact with us. If it's directly with like persons like Cumberly or uh, how can we organize this? Thank you. Thank you. And let's have some very brief responses, if we can, uh, to two very big questions, uh, so that we can make sure we get to these other uh, questions uh, in just a few minutes. Let me let me turn first to our um, WEF colleagues. If you'd want to um, take a crack at uh, either of these questions, particularly maybe the the capacity building uh, question. Sure. sure. Happy to do so. Um, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really great point. You know, we. We, we certainly need, you know, as an organization ourselves to really be able to understand the landscape and kind of highlight what are some of the challenges and then, you know, what are the most promising areas for these kind of common value solutions that we can 
bring, bring uh, a, a more, more diverse stakeholder, stakeholder group around. Um, we ourselves have to be very familiar with what the territory looks like. And that is something that we are absolutely doing. Um, so in, in, in the build up to the Faith in Action report, we created a multi-stakeholder community um, um, not, not unique in name, name, it was the Faith in Action community, community. Uh, um, and, and this uh, community uh, brought together voices from faith-based organizations, uh, as well as senior religious leaders, leaders um, together with those of businesses, uh, public figures, uh, thought leaders. And, and you know, this is where we really kind of had the chance to just listen and, and um, you know, Figure, figure out what, what are the challenges in terms of building capacities, you know, and a lot of this came from language, from understanding the complexities of um, faith-based organizations and, and how businesses work, their processes, uh, but this is, you know, it, it's an ongoing evolution in terms of, you know, how this capacity changes, and this is something that, you know, we're continuously, we're committed to continuously uh, providing a platform for uh, and growing this faith and action community so that we ourselves as an organization, you know, are, are, are fit to be able to host those types of conversations and to, you know, build the capacity of others. Others on screen, Katie or, or David? Sure, I can jump in briefly on USAID's behalf. Um, I think, you know, we would completely agree um, on the concern and the kind of the good question around strengthening the capacity of our own workforce. And our team dedicates, um, I would say, at least 50 percent, but perhaps more um, of our efforts towards um, towards that internal focus on ensuring that our colleagues have the tools and resources um, and knowledge to engage um, religious communities well um, and consistently. And I'll, and I'll just note, note briefly, um, within, within the last year, we're really proud of the launch of a training that was co-developed with the Department of State called Working with Religious Actors in Diplomacy and Development. Um, it's a four-day in-depth training for um, our workforce at our various missions um, in the countries where we operate. And so it's demand driven. So our, our missions um, will request a training and our team will deploy um, to, to the mission um, and, and host a four day training that really gets into um, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of um, engaging with religious communities. Um, there's a, at least one day dedicated to meeting with local religious communities and faith-based organizations. And so We've, we've delivered, delivered um, several of those trainings thus far, and we have more lined up um, to come, but we're very, very much focused in on, on that question um, of, of strengthening the capacity of our workforce. Thanks, Katie. Um, in the interest of time, let me hand it over to Kim to um, address this gentleman's question. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure that I understood the question clearly, because it's always challenging when we have translation. Um, but, you know, I flagged a few issues that I see as areas where we can all work together. Um, and, and if I'm understanding your question correctly, what you want to know is kind of who and how do you engage to make sure that we're hearing your perspective on those key issues, correct? So for the World Bank, the best way to do that um, is to reach out to, to me or somebody like me. We have a team of people and I can make sure you have the email address. And then we can work to connect you to the correct people. Because it may well be that you want to talk about a specific project or about a specific country. Or maybe the issue you want to express additional thoughts or feedback on is about climate change in general. And those are different parts of the bank that would have different specialists or expertise. So I can help to make sure that your inputs are received by the correct people at the bank. Now there are a couple of, of just things to note about that. We receive tons of emails and requests and we work really hard to make sure that people are connected correctly. Um, but if you have either a group or multiple people who want to make sure that one opinion is expressed clearly, then the best way to kind of make sure that we are correctly addressing yours, your, your question or your concern, is to, to come in a group 
right? To send an email that says, you know, we are we together have seen this problem. You know, we are the we are the faith leaders here, or we are the people from this community here. You know, either we have a concern, or we haven't been heard, or we haven't been seen, or here's an opportunity, or you guys did this excellent project two villages away, and I wanted to come to me too, right? Those sorts of things we always want to hear because it helps us to be stronger, to better tailor, and to target our work. Um, so I'll make sure that you have my contact information, um, but just so everybody knows, and the people online, um, we have a specific in, like email inbox that's specific for faith-based organizations, and it's faith, F-A-I-T-H, at worldbank.org. Yeah. Well, perfect. And then just, I just wanted to also note that um, the, the gentleman who was, who was kind of flagging the concern about uh, training and about making sure that, you know, our staff is trained as well, I hear that concern. I see it. I think that it's very important that we have kind of a, a language that we can engage with together, right? You know, we have certain words that we might use at the World Bank that don't fit comfortably with others and other communities, and that's an important thing for us to work on. So, you know, I, I we challenge ourselves to try to be better about using certain phraseology that for us might have perfect economic clarity, but to others might feel slightly uncomfortable, and I would challenge you to um, first of all, ha give us a grain of, of salt. Try, try to know that we are coming at this from a human perspective, even if it doesn't necessarily sound exactly how you'd like it to. But also, please flag it. Let us know. Engage with us as people, because that way we can make sure that we get to a, a spot where we can be really comfortably talking about challenging topics. Thank you. We're, we're just about out of time, but I want to honor the fact that we had two hands over here. Uh, so if you could just briefly share your question. Um, uh, we, I think we'll, we'll, we'll spill over time and uh, perhaps we can just continue the conversation informally once we conclude uh, our session in just, a, just w literally one minute. But if you can just briefly share your question with us, that would be great. My name is Msimbe Kanyoro. I've been involved in ecumenical and inter interfaith matters for a, a very long time. So my question is in form of an observation that I want to make. Um, I think the urge from uh, international organizations of any type, be it multilateral or uh, USID or, or World Economic Forum, for mutuality doesn't have a big foundation. Uh, bec it doesn't have a big foundation because uh, the decisions to have these conversations often come from these bodies internationally. So if you're from a local community and you have international access, you will be present at these meetings. And uh, when they are designed, they are often designed, we need to be engaged with the religious leaders or with the religious community for our own acceptability. For example, if you work with the World Bank, I want to be acceptable in such a community. So let me use the religious community or the religious leadership for that acceptability. The other way that I see that there is a deficit that we need to be thinking about together to find uh, the choice of who comes to these meetings is very often either by somebody being known or a big name in the, the religion that you want to deal with or people that are already exposed. But uh, personally, I think that faith communities are very complicated and leadership doesn't always come, that makes a difference locally, doesn't all the time comes from the hierarchy within that tradition. Sometimes it comes from the grassroots people who are leading that and they have the solutions. They are the ones respected by the local society. And I think that um, uh, I have also seen when we are at some of these international meetings, the tension that some of our own leaders of our, our communities feel when they find that we just met in Washington DC or, <laughs> or in New York or in Brazil. They didn't even know. You come from their community, but they didn't even know because there hasn't been local community that has coordinated participation. So as a person who has participated in many from, mainly from civil society, international civil society, I see that these tensions are often overlooked and uh, they are not worked through. And the power issue that we always, when we are going to a meeting convened by World Bank or USID or whatever, UN, et cetera, the power is from those organizations, even though there is uh, uh, an urge to understand or the faith perspective. And the evidence for me is here, which I conclude with is that I haven't seen 
the citing of we learned this from this religious community and therefore we built on it or we expanded it. I have often seen here is what we have done in country X with the religious communities. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that. And, and uh, this gentleman here in the front, very briefly if you can. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Nepan from Assistant Board of the Vasekia Temple, Golden Mount Temple in Bangkok, Thailand, also the Institute of Buddhist Management for Happiness and Peace Foundation. Uh, I just want to ask how we going to work with USAID or World Bank or World Economic Forum more effectively. Uh, the first thing I would like to share, because uh, there are more than 30,000 temples all over the country, all over the Thailand, and even in small district, it's like a center of community, but they don't claim themselves or they don't aware that they are faith-based organization. So I think the concept is quite different. So uh, I myself have experience to work with USAID indirectly on the, the no ivory, no tiger amulet. The problem is uh, when Katie shared about the that SRE and also that full step, that very good. But from my real experience, it's not that. I share a lot of things that, okay, when we w work on the no ivory, no tiger, relate, not just only work for religious leader, we need to engage villagers or small temple in the very mo remote area. And also now, the e-commerce play a very crucial role. Like we, we have demand from our neighbor country, for example, we need to work on that as well. But it seemed to me, I, I, I kind of, the, the ambassador spokesperson for this campaign two times in the role, but they it feel I felt like it was taken seriously. So they just only hire marketing agency and put the script on my mouth. And I deny that because it's not the way that the religious leader convey. So my point is uh, how we're gonna work uh, together more collaboratively, more effectively. Thank you. Well, thank you for these questions and I'm sorry that we're running uh, over time. I wish we had another half hour because these are actually enormously important questions that were just raised by two uh, civil society actors. Um, if you'll indulge us, maybe we'll just go for a couple more minutes and then we'll conclude where we now have a half hour break uh, before the next session. But I think we need to um, uh, at least begin the conversation in response to these two, two questions. Maybe just 30 seconds from our, our panelists and then we can continue uh, more informally after that. How about uh, the ones in person here, um, Peter and Kim, and then we'll go to our virtual uh, panelists. Sure, thank you. I, our, our colleague in the back there ra raised a set of questions that really we need like three hours to kind of talk through them because they're, they're crucially important. And they also relate to the point that was raised about mutual understanding and, and the capacity of those who work on the donor international organization side. So, you know, we often talk about the, the skills and the capacity that we're trying to provide in terms of religious literacy, right? So what does religious literacy for USAID professionals look like? If you have a limited amount of time for training and professional development, what do you do with that time? What do you teach them? Do you teach them the history and beliefs of, a, of different religions? Eh, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a good use. Maybe that's even dangerous because to give someone a little bit of knowledge about a vastly complicated religion and then they think they know Islam or they know Christianity because they took a two hour course, that's very dangerous. Rather, I would like us instead to focus on things that we heard both of our colleagues on this side talk about. One, the idea that when a development agency enters the social field of religion, that is by its nature a political gesture. It becomes mixed up in local politics that define the relationship between religion, society, and, and the state. And these kinds of maneuvers begin to happen. And development agencies need to be attentive to the vast power asymmetries that are often present in that e equation. Second is also we need to get away from the habit that often you know, government officials have of saying, oh yes, we know the main religious leaders. We know the grand mufti of the country. So then we will engage the grand mufti. And we, ha we, we try in our work to make our colleagues 
better understand that often, you know, it, 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 it's, it's younger religious leaders, it's, it's women religious leaders who maybe don't have the official formal title within the um, uh, organizational schema of the religious institution, but actually have much more influence at the level of community, and to make sure that that in, in engagement is, is inclusive and, and more fulsome. So, thank you. Kim. Um, I just want to, first of all, endorse everything that Peter just said. I completely agree with that that sentiment and with his explanation about the complexities there. I wanted to add one quick comment, um, which is just that this idea of, of shifting a story to telling it about you know what we've learned from this religious community, I think is incredibly valuable. And I'm really glad that you flagged that. Um, you know, We do have those kinds of stories for some of our partners with civil society or for some of our partners who are maybe farmers organizations or other smallholders, um, but it's not something that we've captured effectively yet but it is something that we have learned from. Um, and so I'm really glad that you brought that point forward and, and I, it's something that I'll, I'll take forward in my work. And to the Zoom room, uh, anything else you'd like to add uh, in response to the questions just posed? Just, just a quick comment, comment from me. Um, I, I appreciate, appreciate the comments, the comments um, that came from the floor. floor. Um, on the learnings, you know, that's why on our side for the case studies, we do reflect, you know, what did business learn, what did the faith actor learn in each of the case studies, and that's a key part of what we're trying to do in terms of the community we're bringing together. On the point of diversity, yes, it, it, it matters who comes, who represents, um, who will stand in the place of many, and so I think that's where, you know, having that broader view on faith actors and who else can be included in those conversations is key, as I think has already been stated by my other colleagues. And then just to end on the idea that, you know, faith washing is real. We're seeing that happen across a number of different groups and initiatives that are, are trying to bring in actors, but for their own means. And so the question around value proposition is important. Who is benefiting? Are we seeing that mutual value and understanding? That's a constant question that we continue to ask for the partnerships that we support and for whom we're giving a platform to. Thank you. And Jack and uh, or, or Katie, any final word?